All right, Mr. Treasurer. Not paying attention. That's all right. It's 412. Um, Mr. Brown. Here. Mr. Cole. Present. Mr. Green. Ms. Johnson. Here. Mr. Jordan. Here. Mr. Miller. Here. And Mr. Raglan. You have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. All right. Um, let me just make a few housekeeping announcements, if that qualifies as housekeeping. Um, first and foremost, we have uh, Dr. Dixon, who will not be able to join us today. There was a uh, serious passing in her family, and she's dealing with that in Mississippi. Um, Mr. Raglan just had a passing in his family. Um, where he's got to be up in Maslin, so he can't be here today either. Um, in addition to that, we have our team, the majority of our team upstairs, who will be a part of this presentation, or at least was scheduled to be, but they're having discussion and deliberation around COVID-19 um, to figure out what our next steps are going to be progressively in addressing this pandemic as we understand it today. So um, with that in mind, uh, what we're going to do is where we typically allow ourselves more excavative questions. Was I being Jesse Jackson at this point? Did I come up with something? Um, but where we typically go a little deeper than normal uh, in our discussions on things, we might not have that opportunity today. But do, do know that you, you've got a very uh, adroit, um, very knowledgeable uh, board of education who will also ask these very uh, deep underlying questions. All right. Um, so with that, uh, we can convene the meeting. Well, we've got roll call here. Uh, can we approve our meeting, our minutes? Is there a motion? Second. All right. Moved by Mr. Jordan, seconded by Mr. Brown. Uh, okay. Uh, Board Member Cole? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Miller? Board Member uh, Brown. Sure. Motion carried. All right. Uh, next, we'll move through our monthly financial report. Mr. Treasurer. Okay. This is our monthly financial report for February. Um, to no one's surprise, once again this month, uh, after uh, total revenues were up about 8.4, or they were under plan about 8.4 million for the month, but they're still year to date ahead of plan by about 25 million. Total expenditures uh, were over plan just ever so slightly, uh, about $387,000 over plan for the month, and year to date stand at now 16 million under plan, or about 3% under plan. Uh, as you can see, that bill to cash balance for us of around 359 million. Um, which is, uh, what, 41 million above what we had, had projected. The highlights on the revenue side, property taxes for the month of February or during the month of February, we continue to receive advances from the county auditor on the first half settlement. Um, and we expect that settlement uh, in March. Well, actually, we don't expect it. We did receive it already in March, so we know pretty much where we stand on that. Um, state funding, uh, as expected, continues to run under plan. It's uh, now $8 million under a year to date, and again, we still expect that due to the handling of student wellness and success funds to run about almost $12 million under plan. Other revenues still seem to be the, uh, the poster child for running over plan, um, and in those typical areas of investment income and pilots. Uh, $3.5 million over plan for the month and $13 million year to date. Um, I, I did go back and take a look at, uh, you know, the forecast we talked about, and we made an adjustment for that. And we have increased those estimates in the forecast, but as, as actual results uh, support it, uh, we can look to making additional adjustments perhaps in May. Other than that, nothing notable in revenue. Um, our graph here that you can see, we're, we're pretty much on plan everywhere. Over uh, in the other category, you'll see here that clearly other revenues uh, sort of jump off the page. Um, and uh, you have the explanation for that. Looking at variances, and hopefully, um, Board Member Brown, I get the color coding uh, worked out this month. Um, this, is the, this is a picture of that, and let's go to the, the actual chart to help this out. So um, up there, besides source, it said variance 
green is favorable and red is unfavorable. And I carried that green red um, nomenclature into not only the source titles, but also the cells within the chart. The only uh, variance that changed this month was property taxes, because as we got more advances in, um, they exceeded the monthly ex ex uh, expected amount for the month. And now overall, on a year-to-date basis, on a percentage uh, uh, basis, they're um, now considered to be low because they're under 5%. Um, as you can see, uh, you know, we're on 90% of our revenue, um, we're actually doing pretty good in terms of being on, on plan. Um, moving on to highlights for expenditures, uh, personnel dropped to just 3.8 million under plan year to date. Uh, when I break that out, uh, that's just, it's under 1% on the year-to-date expended. But salaries and wages are very close. They're a million under on, on $272 million expended year-to-date. And benefits, um, as we've noted before, benefits have the larger variance uh, in them. I think some of that's going to work out, because this time around in the forecast, I'm going to pull out the um, Cadillac tax, because I believe that's gone now. So, and, and that was in the five to seven million dollar range each year that got factored into this. So I'll be pulling that out in May, just so you know. Uh, one of the things about personnel, and, it, and we are so close, um, and Scott can speak to it uh, if I don't do it justice, but we are recoding expenditures uh, of an equal amount to the student uh, wellness and success funds, the 11.8 we're going to recode expenditures out of the general fund over to the uh, fund 437? 467. 467. And we are, we're using, in essence, we're supplanting, we're recoding them. So it's activities that qualify as student wellness and success fund activities, but we're taking them out of the general fund. That's not happened. So when we get to that point and that accounting transaction occurs, you'll see a, a fairly significant change in that so that our drop in revenue in the state side is um, matched by a commensurate amount of, of expenditure reductions. Okay? Quick question. Yes. Did our wage reopeners and our negotiated contracts with collective bargain have any effect on this vacillation as well? And I just want to make sure that folks at the table know that. Um, no, because what we did in negotiations has been, you know, I considered that activity when I put together that forecast and then this plan. In the forecast, but not in the appropriation. So when you're talking mm -hmm. about... We may have to bump up When you're talking about the expenditures coming a little close, where we're growing a little closer to what was projected, right. where we had been under plan, my thought is, is that our new collective bargain agreements have had Would have something... Would pushed us that close? Yeah. A little bit of that and a little bit of trying to tweak the estimates and get, okay. get closer. So we were on the, if we didn't have the student success and wellness thing going on, um, we're, well, let's talk property tax revenue. Next month, you're going to find out settlement came in. And so in the aggregate, we're going to be under on property tax. So we've, we flip-flopped in our estimates. Um, it's not huge, but it's one of those situations where typically we like to overestimate revenue and or underestimate revenue over overestimate expenditures. And, and on the property tax side, we got close enough that it did flip on us. And I've not looked at the details of that. But you're, you're right, as we get tweaked it and get closer and closer, um, you know, we ran the risk of, of running over the spending plan. Now, Scott just brought up the appropriations. The, that's a different document, a different creature that we have to look at. And my understanding is we won't adjust appropriations, right? In salaries? We, we might have to, because we did not bump up appropriations for the additional percentages. All right, well, we'll have to see. But still within the plan. He worries about appropriations. I worry about the spending plan. We'll find out yes. who's on. Yes, sir. Who? Because <laughs> we, we just have, we have, I'd like to keep it simple, but we have so many different documents that do different things. And I'm trying to make the forecast and these monthly reports be more of a cash flow plan. But supporting that is the budgeting function and appropriating function. And so we might budget and appropriate at one level, but as you see like in purchase services again, we're under what was budgeted and we're under what was planned. 
and I tried to take the budgets and reduce them by that historical underspending activity to come up with a closer cash flow plan, but we're coming in under both of those. So we've got a couple of documents that, that are similar. They're one's based on the other, but they've got some different assumptions playing with them. So um, we'll we get close to the end of the year, so yeah, we're, right. we're so gonna we're right gonna see what it's gonna be. Makes so um, makes sense. again, I mentioned purchase services continue to run under plan nine point uh, one million, uh, about five point two percent overall, including community schools. Um, on the community school side, uh, we're just 0.7 percent under. Uh, which is 924000 on that $133 million expended year-to-date. Other purchase services seems to be the culprit, and as you know, those, those were the, some of the tuition payments and utilities and some um, property services transactions, all of which, if we're going to be under, that's a good place to be under. Um, all other expenditures are, uh, while it's a large percent, it's not a, a huge uh, dollar amount on the, expen on the overall expenditures. Um, I do combine personnel and charter because those are our two largest categories. So on those two categories combined that comprise 90% of our total year-to-date expenditures, the variance is uh, just $4.7 million or 0.9% on the 525 million that's expended. And that's under, under plan. So we're very close on the vast majority of our expenditures. Um, pictorially, uh, not terribly exciting, but you can just it, it shows that we're on plan uh, when we expand out for all other expenditures. Uh, this is just your graphical display that, yes, purchase services are the culprit. And again, when we get to those variances, uh, you can see the purchase services, um, both in dollar amount and percent variance, uh, are considered high. Um, other objects, for instance, while a large percentage is so it's, it's a million nine, and I realize that might sound like a lot, but in our budget, um, it's it's not. And other expenditures are typically ones that are out of, not within our total control. Uh, to our chart, uh, you can see that the vast majority of these variances are favorable, uh, some larger than others. The only one that changed from last month is personnel, because I said it got closer. It, that, that variance diminished, so it's now low in both amount and percentage. Um, and supplies and debt, while they are unfavorable, the dollar amount of the unfavorableness, if you will, is very, very small. For debt, uh, the unfavorable variance is $15,000, and on the uh, on supplies it's $15,000, and on debt it's $17,000. So they're essentially on target, but because they're slightly positive, they're considered unfavorable. Um, the last thing I'd like to do, if, if you would, you all have the, uh, the report and the MDNA dis discussion, the last two pages are the actual report, and it, if, if we could do a little hands-on uh, project here, what I like to do is to take a look at this and just at the 40,000 foot level, kind of look at which number do you like better for the end of the year game, if you will, and to see what are we on target to do in terms of building or decreasing a cash balance and how close might we be. So if you look at the report, it looks like that, and on page one, it'll have the very first line is general property taxes. And I'm gonna be looking at um, uh, the, if you look from the right, it'll be the third and the fifth line from the right. One entitled total plan based upon the five-year forecast for revenue and adjusted revenue but revised budget for expense. That, that is our plan column. And then two columns to write of that is the November, and I inserted the November 19th five-year forecast. Remember before I was using the May of 19 and I said I would add this one in because it was more current, so I dropped that in. And so as we walk down here, I just I want to talk about just about every line and put a check mark by which one do we believe is going to be more reasonable for the end of the year. So I started with general property tax, and the plan has in it $524.7 million. The forecast has 520. 
Well, knowing what I know now, where we're going to be uh, a little bit under on property taxes, I put a check mark by the November 19 forecast number as being more realistic. I dropped down to state aid, and you can see it's 371.5 million, 371.5 million versus uh, about 360 million. So 11 million, almost 12 million in change difference because the, the forecast I took out the student wellness funds. So over in that column, I check off on the 359, 900. I don't care about the next line, it's not enough. Um, the next line, property tax allocation. I believe the one that's in the plan would be better, so the 3.1 million. So that's the first check mark over in the plan column. Then we get to all other revenues, and because we're exceeding plan, I'm going to go with what I put in the forecast, because in November we did jack those estimates up a little bit. Um, moving on down and other financing sources, I just looked at the total, and I'm going to stick with what's in the forecast at 15.8 million rather than the 12.6. The difference isn't huge. Um, the point of that is when you look at revenue, which line do you like better? Well, the line I like better is my November forecast in terms of predicting where we're going to be at the end of the year. So I'm looking at about $961, $962 million in total revenue for the year. Now looking at expenditures, what do I think is going to be a closer number? Well, when I look at personnel, we've got 610. We're very close to that number. The number in the forecast is 623. I'm going with the plan number. It'll probably be less than that. I'm going with that number, so I put a check mark there. On purchase services, we're running under plan, and we're running under the forecast. So I'm going with the plan number, even though we're likely to be less there. When I get to charter schools, I think because we, as you recall, um, I mentioned that Scott and I looked at those numbers, and we pulled $10 million a year out in, in that line item. So I'm going with the 203 under the, under the forecast plan for my check mark. Supplies and materials, I'm going with a smaller number because we're right on it so far. We're just we're within fifteen thousand dollars of the plan number, so I'm going with the seventeen point nine six seven number. Capital outlay, I'll go with plan. Um, the rest of it, I go with plan, so that I get down to um, we go to the next page. Um, I'm going with the plan numbers through there as well. So as you can see, most of the ones I like for the end of the year are my plan numbers. So what I did then was say, okay, fine. I like the nine hundred and sixty one million in revenue. I like the 935 in expenditures. The difference is plus 26. If you look on line 6.01, the kind of the broad banded one on page two, the broad green line band, it says I was expecting in the plan 27.6 million uh, cash balance build. I come up now thinking, yeah, 26 sounds good. So I believe the plan number. So I believe that, that our balance would be uh, 257 million, per, or, or let's see, it would be, um, yeah, 257 million rather than the 240 in the forecast. We'll actually build a little bit more balance than we did. So that's kind of what I walked through and, and just a kind of a gut feel for where we think these numbers are going to, to come in at. And it was interesting that the revenue numbers out of the forecast seemed to be the predictor. And then when I did the plan, because I think I adjusted it down for that spending pattern, these are, these are a, little bit, uh, a little bit closer. Um, it's just an exercise that I go through. I don't know if it does anything for you, but it, it makes me feel better that I now know that we'll probably be, be you know, build our cash balance by that, that $26, $27 million and um, end up around two fifty seven dollars in the cash balance. Um, so from a forecast standpoint, when I go to do the May, as I adjust the forecast using this column, then that difference between 240 that's in the 240 million in the forecast and 257 that's 17 million will get built into the forecast and carry forward for future years All right so that that helps us so this is what i call it but this is what i often refer to as the organic growth in cash balance where we you know underestimate revenues overestimate expenditures and as we see it work out then we do build a little bit more than what we anticipated so i thought it was a good exercise I personally, when I did it myself, and I think I made a couple of these guys do it with me, I kind of got excited about it, and I thought I'd share it with you. I, I just felt real good that we were close. I don't want to be a buzzkill. Um, then I, don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I think as, as an exercise in looking at um, how prudently we're managing our expenses, I, I think it's, it's a great model. I'm cool with that. Um, it gives us a, a confidence that 
our next reporting of our, of our five-year forecast for next year is ideally going to be favorable. My, my biggest concern is still, and I, I just want everybody to be aware of it, is still state funding. And whether that, how that continues to trend for us, mm -hmm. is this going to continue to decrease? Are we going to be facing another cap? What is it that's going to impact us significantly? This is still, what they apportioned, what they appropriate to us is still 36% of our budget. So, great on managing our resources, um, but the, 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 the ambiguity of not knowing what the state is going to do in any given biennial budget in sure. the future is still a bit nerve-wracking for me. Sure, and this was, this is a very, um, Myopic is not the right word, but kind of a, 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 a very um, microscopic look at just one year. My intention was, you know, how well am I actually planning, projecting, forecasting, if you will, just this one year's expenditures? Mm -hmm. And so, and your 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 points well on, and we'll be hammering that home in May when we when we prepare that forecast. Um, so. Um, it was not a buzzkill. It was just a, a different point of reference. So I appreciate that. No, thank but, you. Thank you for this. Um, and that's it for um, the monthly report. Revenues are up. Expenditures are down. It seems like the uh, projection for the year year end is is you know pretty pretty close. Um, and I'm I'm always trying to avoid those surprises. So we'll see um, we'll we'll see what the next month brings and um, and understand too that that the um, you know this. Recoding will probably help us build a little cash balance too. Okay. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? All right, moving right along. Uh, opportunity study. <clears throat> uh, this next item is is a um, a report that uh, I think everybody's been waiting for. Yes. Um, it's it's been it's been on my evaluation uh, form for uh, way too long, I suppose. And they keep asking me, how are you doing on that? And I says, we're, we're getting there. And we, we moved the due date. And it wasn't because we weren't working on it. It was because this was a, a voluminous, monumental undertaking. Um, I have uh, two folks here um, from the, the, the firm or firms that helped us. Um, where are you guys? Chad and Chris. And, um, and Jenny's here because her new job is to implement all of this, and we'll get to that in a minute. But um, it started uh, as a recommendation uh, or, or notation out of an internal audit that said we don't have written procedure manuals. And this was, I'm going to say, probably four years ago. And in discussions with the finance committee members at that time, it, it morphed. It, sorry, it morphed um, into more than just writing procedures. Um, and it became the opportunity to do an opportunity study, that is look at our processes and see as we document them, are there um, inefficiencies in there? Are there things that, that we could do differently? Are there things that we should do that we aren't doing? Are there things that we're doing that we shouldn't do? Are there things that we do that we should do differently? I don't know if I hit the exhaustive combination of permutation of all of those, but you get the point, is to take a look at it and just say, you know, what are we doing and how are we doing it and how well are we doing it? Um, one of the big steps uh, in, in getting this done at a high level was to get buy-in from staff. And that began with these folks, and specifically Chris, meeting with staff members and allaying their fears that this was um, not a process to tell you how you do something wrong. It's not a process to reduce expenditures, per se. It's not a process to eliminate positions. That this was a very safe, um, uh, exercise to go through in which you could be open about what you do, things that you saw that were inefficient, things you think we ought to be doing, stuff you don't like, problems you have interacting with other departments and other, other functions, all of that to get the best picture we can. And they, 
As far as, as, as everything I heard and everything I witnessed and the reports that I got back from the team that did the investigation, those first meetings accomplished that. We got to that point where everybody was comfortable and there was a high level of, of open participation and disclosure. That was the foundation to get us to a, a really good um, product out of this process. It, it went on, I get kidding, over a year the interviews and the reports and the review of the reports and the reworking of the reports. Um, and we, we have the end result. Before I say that, do you, two have, do, you want to, do you want to add anything about the process that you thought was noteworthy or that I glossed over or? I mean, you're hitting the highlights of it. I mean, you're right. We did come out, we did execute several interviews and I would um, you know, piggyback on what you were saying about the comfort of the team. Um, with the work that you know Chris did initially on, and some of our team members, um, we really got no pushback. And a lot of what our team did, maybe not Chris himself, when we met with them, going through the process, is we tape recorded the conversation because we knew we just felt going in that sitting down and trying to do the step by step by step. Maybe we wouldn't take good notes or miss a thing here and there. I mean, we did have to come back and reevaluate because. When you interview that many people, they sometimes forget what they do. So when we said, here's what your process is, and we sent them back, oh, no, I forgot to tell you this, we forgot to tell you that. But we, but we were able to, those folks were comfortable being tape recorded that they weren't worried about coming off the wrong way, I guess, per se. That's why I wanted to piggyback on that, which was excellent. Um, but yeah, um, the, the reoccurrence, the sending out the, 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 the manuals to the team to make sure they were complete. Um, that went through about two or three times each, so it was pretty, some of the reason why it was spread over, because um, there was some rework involved, stuff like that. It's gonna happen, sometimes things may have changed from the first meeting to the second, just through normal processes. Um, Chris, I don't know if you wanted to add anything with that. You no, know, the staff were remarkably forthcoming, and it was, it was really delightful to get to work with them, and it was a nice environment to ping pong ideas off of. And obviously the people that are doing the work know the work the best, they know where the issues are. So anytime you're able to help create a path to where we no longer have to do these things that you might find frustrating or a little bit difficult, I think they took advantage of that opportunity. And as a whole, I can't say every single individual did. I, I met with, I think, almost every single individual uh, or in a group setting. And a lot of good ideas came from it. So, I would love to tell you that all of these excellent ideas came from just our heads. They certainly didn't. Um, one of the great benefits of doing this group work is that they took ownership of it. And they said, well, this is what we think we can do, or this is what we'd like to try to do. So there's a lot of that in here, too, in this opportunity-esque uh, study. It came from the team, which I think is going to make it even more effective because they should embrace it. They were the genesis. They were accountable to it. So when you implement it, it should be, and most oftentimes is, um, easily, more easily receptive because they said, yes, I remember we came up with that. So I do want to try that. It's not some outside consultant saying this is the best practice from Chicago or from LA. Um, it's very much Columbus City School centric. And so I was really happy with how on board they, they became and how relaxed and, and how they saw this as something they wanted to take advantage of to help, help what they do on a daily basis. So the end result, and I feel like maybe I should lift this up and drop it on the table, but um, the, the metric here is um, 11 different manuals and reports, 956 pages, I think, if I added correctly. Um, these are all different. We have one set of printed documents, and they're all given to us electronically, which we've made copies of in the cloud, which we'll reference in the cloud. Um, and then um, there are some of these that reference opportunities and suggestions for improvement that I'll read. I'm not, I am not reading the payroll procedures manual, thank you very much. Um, I trust that the payroll people did. I probably won't be reading it, but um, I will be reading, where is the one, um, is information technology, um, there's uh, this workflow report, which is, this isn't all of it because the workflow is typically on very large sheets of paper, so it's hard to, hard to print out. And then there's a report in here on um, yeah, you know, actual process improvement 
Um, and then we've also got, um, yeah, the opportunity report. We've also got one in here on looking at our internal auditor citations and reports that helps us respond to some of that. He's writing that down. <laughs> which, which, which is not available to the public. <laughs> but so we, we have now um, the work product, the deliverable. Um, what's next is, is the key question for me. And that's, that's going to be a multifaceted answer. First of all, this is not a one and done project. Otherwise, it would be a waste of time. Um, these types of documents have to be living documents in that we need to regularly look at them and regularly update them. And so we need to build that capacity. We need to build the capacity to have folks that are process procedure oriented, that know how to document the processes and the procedures, that know how to identify areas of improvement and be able to implement them. Part of this was the creation of Jenny's new position, Director of Financial Process Improvement. Part of this was her going to Lean Six Sigma training, which it's the, it's the training that has, it, it's, you have belts, right? Green belts and brown belts and black belts, okay? And that's, 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 that's Chris's forte. And so uh, we, Jenny went to training as well, um, did a project, um, and what was most impressive about that, I happened to stop into one of her meetings, and it was folks from departments that are on the different part of the organizational chart from us, so we, we had no organizational authority over them, but they, they were working. When you think about a team working collaboratively, you have this, this kind of uh, uh, pie-in-the-sky euphoric view of people harmoniously working together, and we all know you get in a group, and there's, there's at least two or three people that just aren't, I mean, you know, it's like pulling teeth and trying to get the group. But this group really was as close to idyllic as, and, I, and it was really neat to watch that process work. I, I, was, I was impressed. Um, so we're gonna, we need to continue that. So that's one of her charges, is to take this, take all of our audit citations, we're gonna organize that, we're gonna prior, assess them and prioritize them and have a work plan to, to begin to implement that process. And she's gonna to continue to work uh, with Chris uh, um, on, on how we develop that capacity and internally to do that. So I'm, I'm excited about it. It's just a, it's a whole nother, you know, work effort that we need to have in place so that, that this is this is a this was a recommendation. This is best practice, you know. Have your procedures documented and keep them up. Why do we have to keep them up? Because this spring break, which is right at Easter time, we're gonna implement the new version of Kronos. And I'm sorry, Munis. That's April. And May is Kronos. So screen, screenshots, some of the steps, already we've got to have to start looking at it to make sure that they're, that they're documented. So we did this huge task. We got, we got kind of to ground zero. Now we've got to keep our heads above ground on this. So, um, and it's only barely a month away, and we're going to be in, in, a, in a new Munis system. And I think Paul said the other day, by May, we'll have the new version of Kronos up and running. So, as you know, things just things change. We grow, and, and we want to continue to keep up with that technological change, but also process changes. Um, some of the things along the way we implemented, um, and and is it okay, Mike, if I tell them about a payables? Is it okay, um, Doctor? No, I mean Mike down here. Uh, went out, and one of the things was, how do we do payables? Because we were writing everybody checks, right? So why don't you do ACH? Why don't you do virtual card payments? Why don't you do something where uh, that's a more digital automated process? Uh, I don't know how many months they spent researching the different firms that are out there, um, but he ended up uh, working with uh, Fifth Third, and um, they put a, put a process in place. When we go live with that, into February? Beginning of February, went, we went live where we take our payables and transmit one file, right? And then they decide how to pay the vendors, and they work with vendors to get them. Well, it's, it's with the partnership with uh, Fifth Third and Avid Exchange. And they pick the payment method, right? Check, ACH, 
or a virtual card, right? And the virtual card has um, some benefit to us, right? Like a rebate. So where where the card we were using before has a rebate, where you're doing just two vendors on it. Now, as that team works to move folks to the virtual card payment, which is advantageous to the vendor, it's also advantageous to us. So um, that's a huge thing. We we go from issuing only checks to, boom, we're doing this. It's I liken that to what we've done in in cash management or in the cash collections. We went from no online collections to a, a fairly significant percentage are being collected online. That's something that Jenny did. And you think about it, we took the state's largest school district with all the buildings and all the staff that we've got, and we went literally from nothing to a pretty good state-of-the-art system for, for all of this. So uh, those two things are pretty cool. I, ultimately, you're going to hear from the audit report that there are some uh, items in that cash collection that have gone from being mentionable to not being mentioned. When, when you hear about the auditor state report. And, and that's a big deal. We're whittling away at that. So um, that's all I have. I just wanted you to know that effectively for this, uh, we're done, but the work is not done. Any questions, anyone? Any other big ahas that you find you need to use any of the town that was so backwards that is new or different or that you're putting in place? Or not the jump. Not to jump out at me, Jenny, any of you guys, did anything that was huge that you? No, not that. I mean, most of the things that when we went through the process or we were evaluating things, if it was something that could be implemented now, we didn't necessarily wait for the study to be published and say, oh, well, now it's in paper, so we're going to move forward. So to his point, some of those things are already outdated because we implemented what we discussed during the process. Um, for example, Stan requested, in addition to the position that I'm now in, he asked for two additional area treasurers. We filled one of those positions, and just last week, we had the first, we finally got through the hiring process, the bidding and all that. That person's now in place, and we're now refunneling how we're handling the receipts. So instead of having 16 different people out there entering receipts, they're all collecting the data and funneling into one person to enter the receipts. Um, to again, do a better job of monitoring to make sure all the documentation is appropriate, that everything's being entered consistently, to try to reduce a lot of that variation that comes, not because people are doing it wrong, but because you've got 16 different people doing it just slightly different. So we've implemented that. And then the second position that he added, we're looking to potentially implement in like the June, July time frame. And part of why we wanted to separate those two out is because we've also since identified through accounts receivable, or through the OIA report that addressed accounts receivable that we need to establish a more, well, just establish a consistent AR process where, you know, Dr. Klein's office has students that we are, need to be getting tuition payments from other schools. So we currently don't have a set process that needs to be followed. So we're evaluating that, trying to get that in place so that they can gather the information that, that's all on their side and then they get it to us. We send out the invoices, then we have a means of tracking it. We anticipate that'll flow into that position, but until we see how the volume flows for this new position, we didn't want it to be a scenario where this new position is either overworked or bored out of our mind. We wanted to try to make sure that we could manage that volume and then reallocate those duties within those two or three positions to make sure that everybody was, for one, that we had the, the um, internal controls set up properly, but also, again, that the workload was evenly distributed so that it was effective and efficient. So that's kind of where we've come from what he asked for with the area treasurer positions. Have you guys had any audit follow-up? Have they been involved in seeing some of the steps? Are they adjusting their audit plans to that now? Or? Oh, they will now that we've talked about it. He's sitting right over <laughs> No. Um, uh, I think what we're dealing with are existing audit reports that once we and they can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is, is once we believe that our corrective action plan has been implemented, then we let them know that it's time you can come back in and, and do a, a recheck or a follow-up. Is that what you call it? Yeah. yeah. And so uh, they, you know, that's what one of the things Jenny's doing is, right. is um, tabulating all of that to see where we are. And then once we're ready, we let them know they come back and, They'll probably say, hey, you're okay here, and then they'll look. 
It's an ongoing process. Everybody, you know, everybody likes, we all need to find places for improvement. So, yeah, but I've already shared some of the things that have been implemented primarily in the areas where I was involved directly, but the opportunity study and the manuals will address a number of their citations or their issues that were outlined in those previous, because a lot of it was you don't have written documentation. Well, now we do. So some of it was just timing of getting that in. So now I've just got to go through those old ones and say, okay, well, of these three that still have outstanding issues, these, say, 10 issues are addressed by these books, feel free to come look at them and review them and go from there. So yes, we're getting there. It, it is a lot of work. Without suggesting anything about uh, reading all of that, will the electronic versions be available online, and, and if so, to who? Yes, and right now, internally. If you would like access to them for your reading pleasure, I, I, could, <laughs> I, could, I could make sure that that's there. Um, I had not intended to put them on a public domain. But I've already made a, an extra set in a folder that I only have access to. Just, I don't want to lose them, you know. I'm, I'm always afraid that somebody will go in and, oh, I deleted that. And I don't, I don't want that to happen. So I've got this set, I've got this set that we can access, and then I've got a set that uh, I've kind of got under lock and key. Electronic copy would be, or access to it. Probably. Sure. Yeah. Um, just my question on the recent automation of these, this payment process to mm -hmm. lenders. Um, has there been any adjustment to the PO process? Um, have we had to make any modifications to, you know, how we do our PO process, our purchase order processes with vendors? Um, that hasn't changed. Okay. Has there? Has that? strengthen that process at all? Well, do we anticipate seeing any more then and nows? Has that, has that helped that us mitigate that? It has an effect. It, okay. that there's no difference in that. It's just the way we pay people. I mean, as far as the <coughs> check, so then and nows can still happen if people don't pull purchase order first. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. All right. That's, uh, that's it? That's it. We're... All right. we're we're done. This is your second time with us, is it not? Yes, it was a more lengthy presentation and everything, but we're just here for more support here just in case today. Got you. Okay, I, I, I remember you from like last year. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much for this, uh, Mr. Treasurer. Uh, next are our budget requests. Uh -huh. um, Mr. Gooding. This, this, uh, Chairman Cole mentioned, obviously, with, with the team being upstairs, you know, with this coronavirus, Thanks. usually we'd have folks come in and walk through these, so I'm going to... I'm going to take this because we talked through with the team. I think we can do these. So, um, actually, before I get this one, but uh, the first thing that's on here, 5.01, is budget transfers. As Stan alluded to before, um, when we built the, the appropriations resolution at that time last May, June, we weren't sure where the student wellness success funds were going to lie. So, at that point, they were built into the general fund $11,803,798. So what we are now doing is transferring that from the general fund and moving it into fund 467, which we alluded to. So you'll see a decrease, um, as we listed here, we're going to decrease it from the personnel category. Because in the general fund, the board approves personnel, which is salary and benefits, and then all of the non-operating by OPU. Because our intent, our plan for the use of these is to recode expenditures that qualify under those 11 categories that, that, that they've listed out what how you can spend these funds on um, social, emotional, and, and health of the students. So we're looking at social workers and school nurses that are those costs for us far exceed this. So we're gonna we're gonna change the appropriation. We're gonna recode ex existing um, expenses into this fund to cover that. So that's that piece. So that is the f the first and last piece as you see on the agenda here. The other pieces are reallocation of funds that we received. Um, from the county auditor on looking at Stan if he wants to chime in on this um, We received a refund from the uh, a tax refund from the county auditor in the, the amount of 1.4 million dollars So the way that came in was a reduction of a current year expense. So those expenses are showing Obviously under budget now We're going to take those and reallocate those for other things that we've identified as needs 
The first thing that we've done is we've heard a presentation from our Career and Technical Education Department. Mr. Ed O'Reilly is here in, in the back. Um, we're looking to do an enhancement to our HVAC program. Um, and Ed, throw something up at me if I say this wrong, but we're moving from a residential HVAC program to a commercial HVAC program. And as I understand it, the benefit of that is as the current program is the residential HVAC, they can only do residential HVAC. But with a commercial program, you can do both, commercial and residential. So we're going to make that change, provide our students um, more opportunities once they graduate with that endorsement, uh, and look at, uh, at possible revenue enhancements that we'll be able to do some, we'll get some additional funding coming in, as well as some training and, and corporate training that we'll be able to do with folks and work with, with the partners to bring some additional money in there. So that, that amount is 205000 that we're transferring from um, the treasurer's budget into the career technical education program. The other is an expansion that we're doing with our summer ex summer school experience. This year is a little different than we've done in the past. Um, the the main focus of our funding is coming from federal grants, which is our Title I for economically disadvantaged students. We have four million dollars that we've earmarked to use from Title I to support that. Unfortunately, every one of our schools is not a Title I eligible school. Out of 109, we've got 108, but one doesn't count. So those students we have to pay for out of the general fund. Um, and as we went through this, a very extensive process working with the academic services team to figure out what that program should look like because we want it to be different. The total request was, um, it's approximately $4.8 million. So we have 300,000 right now in the general fund for non-operating. So we're asking for, to make up that difference an additional 500,000, which will get them to the 4.8 that they need. And I believe we've had at least once or twice presentations at the Board of Education meeting about what that summer school experience will look like. Um, so we're trying to do some things very different with that. The last piece is 200,000 for um, additional um, resources for the Legal Services Department. Um, for our Carter Raines contract that we have that processes claim services where we handle, um, we process settlements for injury or property damages that are, that are um, unfortunately take place and we, they process those for us. So those claims are running higher than we had expected and the additional request is for 200000 But everything all together, there's no overall increase or decrease to the budget. We're just reallocating things within the existing funds. So I'm looking back at those two gentlemen and getting Osri. Did I, did I get it right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being here to help me make sure. <laughs> Is there any questions on those? That's one of the highest paid trades out there. I mean, and so I think it's really important to, to implement that. But uh, what, are these students, are these adult students? Are these high school students or where? Accommodation. Yeah. Actually, it'll be a, a program institute at the 11th and 12th grade level, oh, we but we'll also be opening up the last year for adult education. Yeah. And that's, that's where you can start. So when you, when you do that, do you, are these folks working with commercial installers of HVAC kind of equipment too? And, yeah, yeah, and actually we have, we have um, Air Force One, who's a commercial company, mm -hmm. who is helping us um, design the lab and design the curriculum so that it is up to, up to standards on today's standards. So okay. it'll be very relevant and we'll have a lot of folks coming in for training, including Columbus City School employees who can be trained on, um, be up trained as commercial HVAC. Thank you. On that, I mean, this is really revolutionary for us. Um, this is us taking this career tech piece to the next level. It's been an absolute pleasure and blessing to see this team be able to think outside of the box and how to grow this program into something that becomes uh, regionally relevant. And these youngsters, again, I, I always say it, these youngsters, nine out of every 10 of them are finishing, finishing well and with credentials ready to work. So a lot of these kids are apprenticing with companies right now working. Am I wrong? They are. They are working. They're making a living, what we are shooting for as a living wage at, you know, $15 an hour. So these are youngsters who are, who are actually doing it. And the fact that we're looking more in advance for adapt, ad adapting this for, career, for adult education is, is the next big step for us. Good. I'm sorry.
So I'll move. Yep. Do you, do you want a, uh, a motion to forward this on to um, the board? Uh, yes, please. Yes, please. Forgive me. I wasn't sure if there was anybody else who had something to say about their particular department. Yep. Okay. So is there a motion to approve this, uh, re this budget request for uh, school year 2020? 20, 20. Okay, um, Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Miller? Mr. Miller? Yes. Okay, sorry, didn't hear you. Uh, board Member Brown? Yes. And uh, Board Member Cole? Yes. That motion carried. Okay, and we'll go into the next item here. Um, again, I will try to keep this at a high level um, since the folks are up, obviously upstairs dealing with a very uh, critical issue. So what we have here is um, this is the FY21, so this is the 2021 fiscal year uh, general fund personnel request. Um, as we go through these, obviously, as, as we make any of these recommendations, these are always going to be, and I'll go through these slides pretty quick for you, um, everything's going to be driven by our mission, it's going to be dri driven by our vision, our core values, our strategic goals, and this work began um, back in calendar year 2015. It was as the district was preparing for an operating levy which came before the community in November of 2016. We were looking at ways to develop metrics around the way we allocate resources in the form of, of staffing. And it became very difficult because there weren't really best practices out there or benchmarks that we could use metrics for school districts. Um, so we Worked with, worked with um, a group, Romberg and Associates out of Detroit, Michigan, that had done some work with Plant Moran and, and partnered with the district to try to help us develop those. And it was really interesting as we got into those conversations. Um, unfortunately, we're talking, you know, ties, ties in with this coronavirus, you know, the pandemic that we're talking about right now, and cleaning. What is the best, what is the best practice for cleaning of a classroom? What, what's the frequency? Are you emptying trash cans every day, every third day? Like we got into those, those real in the weed kind of conversations and we're, we're still working through that. So that work led into very small, that's just for illustration purposes, so I'll walk you through this one. So this is, um, we are entering the, the fifth year of our five year plan. So the levy um, request that came before the community included 324.5 staffing, FTE, or full-time equivalencies to be phased in over a five-year period. So as you look at this chart, um, the, the top section that has the yellow on the far left, that was the original levy plan. So that was back then. And we have, we've had change in leadership, we've had change in strategic plans, we've had change in, in leadership at the board level. There's been a lot of things that have, that have happened over time that we've had to make adjustments to. Um, so the things below that are things that we're looking at with changes um, that we've, we've incorporated through programmatic design changes, through contract negotiations with, um, with our teaching and classified unions. Um, there were some changes in there specifically for uh, social emotional behavior practitioners for the social emotional behavior uh, issues that we're dealing with. We had um, 15 teachers in there for the, for that program. We had in increases in instructional assistance um, for PEAK, which is our, our in-school in suspension. We had 40, 40 new positions there. So things things occur. So as we move into this this next year, where we've we've allocated 159 FTE. Um, all of those you will not see as a request. We still have seven point, we're only requesting 151.75 of those. Um, 7.25 that Dr. Dixon still kind of has in her pocket for further review to see if there's some things that we need to do um, as we, and as we move forward. Obviously, as you see the presentation, they're not prioritized any other way other than by department, it's alphabetical. Um, but it does fit that academic services is first because that is the primary focus of what we do. As, as we get into academic services, um, as I said, the lion's share of this is for academics. It's 134 FTE. Uh, you'll see here the breakdown, and this is, this is again, just for next year. Uh, we have six FTE for career tech teachers. There are four instructional assistants for early childhood education, four classroom teachers for early childhood education, Six classified, or um, the instructional assistants for the ESL or the English, English as a second language or English language learners. 
gifted and talented, those are 23 teachers for a gifted and talented program, which we heard a presentation at the last board meeting about the new delivery model that will be uh, pushed out next year. Uh, the two items that you have here highlighted in yellow, those are the pieces that were part of the, the, co the contract negotiations with CEA. So those are the 42 instructional assistants for the PEAK program and the 15 social emotional learning practitioners that I just mentioned. There are 10 new FTE for school nurses, 15 new FTE for social workers, and nine um, FTE for special education. And we kind of have those kind of as a, as a bookmark, if you will, because there's things that change throughout the year where students coming in with IEPs or individualized education plans, or 504 plans that we just have to make adjustments to because at this point we don't know if we're gonna need a new teacher for a multi-disability multi classroom, an emotionally disabled classroom. We're just not sure what that is, but we wanna make sure we've got, got that in here. Uh, accountability, um, we have 0.75 request. There are three requests of 0.25, and the reason for that is these are enrollment specialists that are housed at Central Enrollment that are currently nine-month employees, and the request is because of the, the increased workload that we have, moving them from a nine-month position to 12-month position. So that's where the, the 0.75 piece is. Business and operations, uh, Marie Oldham's team has a total request of six FTE. Four are for custodial services to um, in increase the workload in, in our school buildings and two positions in the transportation department. Equity, uh, there's a, there was a request this year which the position has been posted and I'm not even sure, I don't think, have they, has that person been approved yet? So, um but I believe there's an expectation that this individual will begin this fall. Correct. So that position for the the chief of equity has been, was part of the FY20 allocation, the position has been the I interview, and I think there's been a selection made. I'm not sure if they've been approved yet, but the piece that we, we missed was ha having support staff for that. So we've obviously, we've added a secretary position for, for this individual for next year. Legal services, one of the things that we have, obviously being a district this size, one of the issues that we run into is, is um, records requests, um, public records officers. So what we have here is a request for a 1.0 1, 1 FTE for a records custodian to handle those things through our legal services department um, to be in compliance with our board policy 8310 that we've listed there. Superintendent's office, we have a, one position here for a project manager, we, we, we really haven't created the, the actual definition of what this, what this is gonna be, um, but we're, we're looking at somebody to come in that we can, with all of these projects that we have going on with our strategic plan, our portrait of our graduate work, all these things, we need somebody to kind of manage that process. So we've, we've called it a project manager slash strategy that can kind of help run that and, and be a, the point of contact for all the things that we're doing instead of working in silos, we've got somebody kind of driving that work. Technology, we have three positions here. Um, the first one is a cybersecurity program administrator, a 1.0. We have an, um, an education systems administrator integration specialist, and this was a, this was a team effort request on this part. We had um, the, the accountability, business and operations, and technology all coming together that identified this need, which was great through our process because everybody knew what a problem was and we, we came together and the decision, the collective decision was that we were this is something that needed to reside in the technology department. Yes, sir. Um, this is all pedagogical, yes. This is all relative to uh, our curriculum, yes. Absolutely. And I'm looking at the okay, two, yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nicole, Dr. Eric um, Johnson, Mr. Miller, and Mr. John. Um, so the cybersecurity program administrator, right? We, we have a very good cybersecurity posture from the sense that we have monitoring in place. We are reactive, we are preventing attacks every day over 1,000, 1,500 people try to hack into us and we are tracking that. But the cybersecurity program administrator gives us the overarching risk management program and they will run that and they will set up policies and guidelines on how to do that. And that is, um, that is also very important for a pedagogy because uh, we are going to have our students um, also hacking in and trying to explore uh, new ways of learning technology. And then we have, Mr. 
right? We're here for we're putting together a cybersecurity program. This mm -hmm. person can perhaps help out with the design of the program okay. and um, other things. The Ed Systems Administrator, um, a lot of it hinges on transportation as well. Um, you know, we have the, the veterans and we have Tyler Drive and we have several integration issues today. And you are sitting on board meetings and you've heard a lot of our transportation issues surface up there. So we believe having a, a specialized resource to address that is going to help us greatly. The IT trainer, we, um, we traditionally do a good job rolling out technology, but we haven't really uh, focused on communicating and training people. We, this is kind of, think of this as a cedar role to build up an instructional technology integration program in place so that we can develop deliver more PD, if anything, this one directly affects our teaching and learning in the classrooms. Okay. Shukriya. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? No. I, I yes. just kind of have a... So I've got one, I've got one, one more. Do, Before I you, yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. So I can hit the last one, then we can, yeah, we can yeah. hit anything you want. And the last one we had was just five additional FTE um, to reduce class sizes for our, our kindergarten programs. Um, this is to move the, the contractual class size um, maximums from 29 to 28 position, or to 29 students per classroom, to, per, kindergarten classroom teacher, say that slowly, um, and then I believe the years after that, as we'll see in an FY22, is to move that down from 28 to 27. So this is five that would be um, spread out throughout the district to make sure that we stay within those contractual maximums. With that, I am done. I, <laughs> my question's more, just so I understand this graphic here. So we're, when we're looking at the numbers in this column, um, oh yeah, thank you. So yes. the, the yellow column. Yes. Some of those uh, requests are related to the plan that was proposed when you went out for the levy. Correct, yes. And then below that line are just kind of initiatives that had followed. Um, They've come up since then. I just was yes. Okay. Yes. I'm just confirming my understanding. Yeah. Okay. Because we started it, it started out as the levy plan, and then over time it evolved, so it became this general fund overall staffing plan that took the original levy request as well as all these other programmatic things that we had to address. So. Yes. Correct. Yeah, right. Yep. Right. And I, yes. I, I want to reemphasize too because that's a great question. I want to reemphasize the fact that the organization has gone through some contraction and expansion with regard to leadership. Mm -hmm. So as leadership changed, transformed, yeah. so that how we, mm -hmm. so that this process evolved in and of itself, where we design these priorities within the organization. So I, I just wanted to make sure that we emphasize that as well, that this is still a, a growth process. It's one that we were in fidelity with, um, that we've been committed to from day one, um, and that we're now continuing to build up on. Let me also add to that from a finance perspective that in this time, in, within this interim of transformation and evolution, we also saw some decline in our funding. We ended up being capped in that process to seven, from 7% 7 to 4, 4.5%. Um, so we also saw some economic changes on our side as well. I just wanted to make sure you got yeah. it. And, and to piggyback on that, we, I mean, we had to make some very, very difficult decisions, and we were fortunate to have a plan like this because we were, as we built it from the ground up, when we had that shortage of revenue, where the, the assumptions had to change, we had to go make budget reductions. And we were able to look at this, and just like we built it, we were able to kind of make changes to it and, and take away and deconstruct it because we were able to take positions that, that weren't actual bodies in, in the buildings yet and, and delay those hirings and move those positions that in, in FY20, we, did, we had to move everything out to FY21 so that we could handle handle that so that we were it, it reduced the the impact of having to to cut existing staff because we were able to delay those expenditures and then as our cash position improved then we were able to start bringing those back in a little bit at a, at a time um, as opposed to bringing everybody in and then laying them off right away which would have been the wrong thing to do so we were able to use this plan to help us um, kind of weather that storm a little bit and then as we move forward through finishing this portrait of our graduate work and then into the next strategic plan Hopefully that's going to lead us into what what we'll see as the next five year staffing five year staffing plan. So it's just going to continue to, to mature. Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Mr. Gooding. You're welcome.
Um, that can, if that concludes, and again, there are no questions um, or comments, I thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Um, I hope that this has uh, been very informational. Um, thank you for your request to move some of this forward for board deliberation. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll, I'll make the motion. All right. Motion by Mr. Jordan. Seconded by? Aye. Aye. We don't need to move this forward. So, what I'll do? We, I'm sorry, Andy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. Because this will come forward as once we will we'll end up in May, June, talk, bring, bringing the appropriation resolution, okay. and this will this be this okay. will be this will become the basis for that personnel piece. I mean, we we can, but no, we'll, we'll be doing it then too. So either okay. way. Then I'm sorry I ruined that. Okay. Yeah, no, 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 that, up. <laughs> that, that was a great. That was a great. That was a great question. You, you, can, you can take credit for second motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Katie is on it, man. Mr. Wait, Jordan. On, wait a minute. <laughs> Mr. Miller. Yes. Board Member Brown. Yes. Board Member Cole. Yes. And um, Ms. Yes. Johnson. Yes. That motion carried. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. And everybody stay healthy, please. Wash your hands. Yes. Eat healthy. Uh -huh. Eat healthy. That'll help you too. And get some rest and don't worry about this yeah. stuff. <laughs>